<laughs> Good evening, everyone. Ooh, I like this. Well, you can see that. Yeah, I like that. Big, big print and everything. I, I can see it. <laughs> wow, wow. 183 in your hymn books, please. We'll sing this very song that they're playing. Beneath the cross of Jesus. Let's all stand to. number 45 we're gonna kind of keep the same uh, flow that he does on Wednesday nights anyway surely goodness and mercy 45 
back at my notes, 270, yes. And that's wonderful words of life. Giving instructions to make sure that the mic was pulled down so it doesn't block my face. So I can't get any taller, so I have to move this down. So <clears throat> can everybody see me? <laughs> now, it's good to be here tonight. I'm glad to be here. I, I, unfortunate that I have to preach under the circumstances that Brother Rick isn't here, but I'm glad to be able to do it. I'll, uh, I'll tell you what I know about a few things, and then we'll do the announcements. Um, well, I'll do the announcements first. Uh, I didn't realize, but when I'll be preaching this Sunday, it'll be at sunrise. It, that didn't hit me till a little while ago. Uh, but sunrise service, 6 o'clock uh, this Sunday, and then uh, we'll have observance of the Lord's Supper at 6 o'clock that evening. So... Um, the food that will be provided for the breakfast following the service will be uh, the staples of breakfast, pretty much what they do for a brotherhood, which will be the sausage, the bacon, the eggs, the grits, orange juice, coffee, milk. Those things will be provided back there. Um, we've asked you to bring casseroles or any covered dishes or fruit, whatever it is that you would like to add to that, please bring that. So uh, remember that. We'll have a uh, fellowship and eating following the service. So um, keep that in mind. Also, uh, is that it, brother? Anything else? And they could use some hands if you know how to cook. And you, you, they could use some extra help back there to, to help prepare it. So um, if you want to help Travis, get with Travis. And uh, I'm sure they won't turn down, turn down any help. So anything with that? Anything else? All right, um, as I mentioned, Easter sunrise service, 6 a.m., with breakfast to follow. On April 2nd at 1.30, we're going to have the ladies' circle meeting, and then that'll be, I'm assuming, Miss Billy Jordan's house. Okay. Um, then we have April the 21st, 7 o'clock, Brotherhood Breakfast. And then every third Sunday, remember, is Acts, bring small boxes of cereal and sugar. So that's the announcements that I have. Does anyone have anything else they need to add or would like to add? Okay, we're good there. So I, we'll get into the prayer request. 
couple of the ones I know, I, I, uh, I got an update from Shana, but I uh, got to talk to Cody this morning through text around mid-morning, noon, somewhere in there. Um, I don't know what all y'all do know and what you don't know, but they, they figured out what was wrong with him, and it was uh, an ulcer that had ruptured, as I understand it, and was leaking, and that fluid from the ulcer was uh, inflaming his pancreas, which was causing him a lot of pain. So there was surgery on the table. Now they think they can control it with meds. Uh, so he's going to be taking medications, I believe, starting tomorrow. For the last few days, he's been on ice chips. So they're hoping maybe to start him on soft food tomorrow. I think his pain was around a 4 yesterday, but his pain was back up to a 10 today. So uh, he's in some discomfort there. So pray, give the doctors wisdom. Uh, to continue trying to figure out a treatment regimen for him, to get him well, get him back here. My prayers for the Lord to return him back here to his church, to his flock, as the under-shepherd here, praying for he'll get back here and be able to do that. So keep him in your prayer. Keep Cody. I think Cody's going back and forth. Keep him in your prayers as well. So uh, that's what I know about Brother Rick. Uh, Anders is still on, uh, <clears throat> still on schedule to begin his chemo April the 4th. April the 4th. So my prayer's been, and I ask for you to pray that whatever, you know, their concern is the CMV when they wipe out his immune system, the CMV that he has fought pretty much his whole life will come back strong and, and possibly get into his organs. And uh, they do not want that to happen. They do not want that to happen. So pray that whatever the medicine does or does not do, that the Lord's hand will move and do what needs to be accomplished to see that this thing uh, works out uh, the way we're all praying. So, so I believe God answers prayer. I know he's answered a big one for me this past week, and I thank you all that were praying for me. Uh, it means a lot to me. But uh, just keep Amber and Seth in your prayers. I see God's hand working in this because from what I understand, to me, I haven't been told this, but from what I understand, uh, he's been well over a year or so with that CMV, and <clears throat> it has not got in his organs. So that's a victory. It has not got in his organs. The second thing that's amazing to me is that the drugs they've had him on to fight the CMV, one of them is phoscarnate, and I can't think of the other one, but... Phoscarnate is very bad on your kidneys. It's very bad on your kidneys. And he has been on it probably longer than you should be at one time. His kidney tests come back excellent. So he has had nothing wrong with his kidneys, and that to me that's amazing having been on that medicine. So keep your prayers coming. God's hand moves according to our prayers. I do believe that. So um, I don't have any other things that I need to mention as far as the prayers other than what's on our prayer list. Does anyone else have any prayers? We need to look. Yep. And I tell you what, I've never seen such a happy baby. And his whole life, a lot of it's been in the hospital. And uh, I know I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. So we do covet your prayers and thank you for them. Anything else right over here? Anything? Right here, I thought I'd seen a hand go up. Okay. So she's progressing and doing doing better. Okay. Good. 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 All right. Anything else right in here? I do want to remember Miss Joan. I uh, do remember Laurie. Um, 
They have called hospice in. I don't really know what the latest is, if anyone has an update on that. But I know Miss Joan asked for us to pray for mercy, and that's what I've been doing, and that's what I'll continue to do. So keep Miss Joan in your prayers, uh, and keep Lori and her family, keep all them in your prayers as well. Anything else right in here? Granddaughter Camden. 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 Need to pray for her. She has high liver enzymes. Brother, is it spelled with a C or a K? C. C. I had it right. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Okay, what about right here? Any prayer requests right in here? Okay, over here, any prayer requests? It's two o'clock. Two o'clock, okay. I thought that was last week. Huh? I am, I'm going to get to the missionaries. Miss Marie having surgery. Okay. Yes. John is preaching tonight in Hillcrest, Georgia, and he leaves in the morning to go to New Mexico and Reno, where he'll pick up the men and continue um, Sunday. He's preaching in New York City. We'll be praying for him. And we haven't yet figured out how that bridge that went down is going to affect how <coughs> Right. Okay. Yeah, I think Brother John, he, he's gone. He won't be back till he gets back from Kenya, will he? Yeah. The end of May. Yeah. So he, he, he's, he's got quite a road trip ahead of him. Uh, so pray for him. Pray for traveling mercy. Pray for everything to go smoothly. I, I watched the bridge collapse like everybody else. I don't know a lot about it. For what I understand, they also have tunnels that they go under the water with so I don't know if that's for commuters or what but uh, so that may be an alternative route they have tunnels that go under the water um, from what I what I understood so um, but speaking of brother John and all our missionaries keep all of our missionaries uh, in your prayers they're on the front lines and uh, I mean they're the ones that oftentimes have forsaken or left every comfort they had their familiarity with their family, their friends, their, their communities, and they've gone off and had to learn a new language, new customs, a new culture, and they're all doing that in obedience to the call of God on their heart. So keep them in your prayers for what they go through. Pray that, that everything they uh, do and accomplish, that it will cause the, the God's kingdom to increase and the devil's kingdom to decrease, and pray that they'll win many souls for the cause of Christ. And pray and, and pray for them. So, anything else? Any any other? Yes. Huh? Haiti. Who? Haiti. 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 The country. Haiti. 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 My hearing's not what it used to be. I was trying to. I was like, "Who's Katie?" I see Katie sitting right on. Yeah, pray for her too. <laughs> Haiti. <clears throat> yeah, I tell you what I know about Haiti. Is that's where voodoo originated. But what I do know about is from Black Hawk Down, if you ever seen that movie, uh, it, was a, it was a country ran by thugs and, and warlords and gangs back when Black Hawk Down happened, and I still think it is for the most part. Um, so it's a very vicious place, uh, so we do need to pray for our missionaries over there that are in harm's way, from what I understood from... Uh, what we were told by Brother John, they're, they're having to buckle down in their homes and, and stay there. Um, so I'm sure it's a very bad, intense situation. So keep, keep the people of Haiti, keep our missionaries that are serving God there, keep all of them in your prayers. Anything else? I believe in the power of prayer. If you got a prayer, let's... let's uh, Let's, let's get it out here and get it, get it done, get prayed, get somebody prayed over. Okay. 
Well, if there's no one else, then uh, Brother Mike, do you mind praying for us? Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before a holy and righteous God, dear Lord. We uh, give all praise and thanks to you, dear Lord. We are seeking your your guidance and your answers, dear Lord, and we're seeking uh, that you increase our faith, our faith in you, Lord, and we know that you have your hand on us, dear Lord, and we're so thankful for that, and we thank you most of all, dear Lord, for saving our souls, dear Lord. If you didn't do anything else for us, that'd be, that'd be all that uh, would need to be done, dear Lord, and we we can't thank you enough for that. For this Sunday, uh, we celebrate uh, you rose from the dead. We thank you that you conquered the death and the grave, dear Lord. And that old stone couldn't hold you back. And dear Lord, we just uh, praise your name for all that you've done in each and every one of our lives. We uh, pray for little Anders dear, tonight, dear Lord, and we ask that you just be with him, dear Lord, and uh, his time's coming up, dear Lord, and he's going to have a bone marrow transplant. And we just ask that you just uh, keep your hands on him. You've had your hands on him all this time. For An uh, Amber and Seth, dear Lord, we ask uh, uh, that you just continue to hold them in your arms. Dear Lord, we thank you for that family and just always lift them up and pray that you just uh, keep them in your hands. Dear Lord, for Lori, and, uh, we lift Lori up to you tonight, dear Lord, and pray for mercy for Miss Joan, for Kenny Sears, uh, the, the family, Lord, we just uh, pray for that family, dear Lord, and they've called hospice in, dear Lord, and we ask for mercy and that you just... Uh, Take the pain away, dear Lord, and, and uh, just give comfort, dear Lord, for that. For Matthew Hood, we pray for him, and it's uh, been a blessing that he's been able to come back home, dear Lord. And uh, We ask that you just be with his father, Michael, and uh, his mother, Tammy, dear Lord, as they have their son home and don't have to travel anymore. <laughs> Uh, that Matthew would get the equipment that he needs at home, Lord, to be able to function at his house and do what he needs to do and that his uh, legs would heal so he could uh, get fitted for his prosthetics. And dear Lord, we, we thank you for uh, answering those prayers. And for uh, Miss Ann, she hadn't been in our church very long and uh, just all the young ladies, all of a sudden just had a stroke and I, I know she was out fighting the fire and I guess uh, things just got too far for her Lord and we thank you for being able to bring her back home and that she's closer to us and thank you for Miss Lisa that's staying in touch with her Lord and uh, just let her know that we're uh, all praying for her and, and all lifting her up Dear Lord, for Brother John as he travels. Uh, dear Lord, we ask that you just be with Brother John. Give him the, uh, the alertness to, to watch out for other people on the road. It's not really Brother John, but it's other people that will uh, put him in harm's way. And we pray that the young men that he takes up and carries to these other churches, that they'll, they'll be able to bear fruit be able to uh, take the gospel back home to their countries and be able to tell others about your saving grace. Dear Lord, for all of our missionaries, not just the ones that we support, but all of them that stand on that solid rock of Jesus Christ. As uh, Brother Rick said, that they, they've left friends, they've left countries, they've left uh, families. Uh, I even knew one that he, they had to leave their children here. Him and his wife uh, went to Guatemala. They uh, were just in contact. Uh, oh, if you do a phone. And uh, it, it's hard on them, dear Lord, but they wouldn't rather be anywhere else but in the arms of our Lord Jesus Christ and serving you. 
And I wish we all had the heart like that, Lord. That you would increase our faith and increase our knowledge and just uh, open our minds and our hearts up to be more like you. Dear Lord, we pray for Brother Rick tonight. Dear Lord, he's, he's on the bed of affliction and we know that you've had your hand on him, dear Lord. And we just pray that you just be with Brother Rick and get him safely home to his family, Lord. And for Cody as he travels, we ask for traveling grace that you uh, just can't uh, give Cody traveling grace up and down the dangerous highways. For uh, Brother Rick tonight, golden as he preaches. Dear Lord, I pray that you just hide him behind the cross. Dear Lord, I pray that you allow him, give him the, 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 the knowledge. Well, he has the knowledge. But he, give him the heart to, to preach with power and demonstration of your Holy Spirit, dear Lord. Just, just let it come out of him, dear Lord. Dear Lord, everything that we say and do here, dear Lord, let it be you that gets all the glory for everything that we do and say. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to tell you that I love you tonight. And I thank you for all the brethren and sisters that have attended tonight to hear you work. Dear Lord, give us a, a good night. Let us rejoice in the Lord. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise because you are worthy in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, uh, if you would, go ahead. I hope you got your Bibles with you. Uh, go ahead and open up your Bibles to uh, Luke. We're going to be chapter 23. We're going to start out around verse 18. Uh, I'm always excited. I'm always happy to be able to have an opportunity to preach. I'm not, not that happy about under the circumstances in which this came about, but I'm going to do my best, and uh, I'm going to do my best Sunday, so I ask you to pray for me on that. Um, this message I have tonight is a, it's a sermon that I've never preached before, but uh, it's probably two years old, maybe three years old. I've just never had an opportunity to preach it. Uh, it could be preached at any time of the year, but it kind of falls into Passover a little bit. But it's maybe not the, the normal Passover uh, message that, you, that you'll hear. But, uh, you know, I want to talk a lot, too, about the cross because you can't get away from the cross. The churches can try to get away from the cross. And they want to get away from the blood. I was, I was uh, reading something. I think Tony showed it to me. I don't remember. But they're, they're, this church is outreach. I think it was, was an Elevation Church. That, that, yeah, Elevation Church. Uh, Steve Furtick, heretic. So just put that out there for you. But he was out there, and they're, they're having a big push to try to get people in church. And they had a strategy to get people in church. And their strategy was that we are not going to talk about the blood. How can you not talk about the blood? I mean, this is Passover week. This is a week that our Lord and Savior is being prepared. Deception is afoot. Deceit is afoot. Traitorous hearts are afoot. He's fixing to be sold over for 30 pieces of silver. You know what? When you look forward at things and you see dread of things that are coming that you know are coming, you dread it. I do. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew. He knew exactly what it meant to be hung on that cross. He knew what crucifixion was going to be like. How many of us would have kept on walking down that road toward that cruel cross knowing what was ahead? Crucifixion. The cross. Now, the cross is not what I'm going to preach on tonight, but I will preach on it, I think, Sunday. But you know what? When, when God, a holy God, had to come down to a depraved man, you know where they met? They met at the intersection of the cross. That's where God in his holiness met sinful man and made a way, made a way. But tonight, when we, when we talk about Jesus Christ and we look at him, those of us that are saved and we've been blood-bought, born again, and we're covered under the blood of Jesus, you know, when I've said it before, when God looks down at those that are saved and believe in Jesus Christ and accepted him as their Lord and Savior, he sees his son. But if you're within the sound of my voice on Facebook or you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know what Christ, God sees when he looks at you? He sees the lost. 
And you know what he sees when he sees the law, how miserably we have failed. Has anybody in here kept the law? The Ten Commandments? Nobody. And even after we get saved, guess what? We still sin. But he looks down and he sees the blood of his son upon us. He sees the blood of his son upon his children. But I want to talk about another person tonight that's involved in the Passover story. Not much said about him in the books. He's mentioned in the Gospels, but not a lot of details given about him. But I looked at him, and I got to reflecting, and I saw a lot of commonality between this man and myself. And I think if we look at this, we'll see among all of us a lot of commonality between this man and ourselves. You see, I believe God's grace will cover anybody. Matter of fact, every sin is covered except for what? The sin of unbelief. I believe that the worst killer in the world can on his deathbed, if he with a sincere and pure heart accepts Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, he'll go to heaven. Nothing he's got to do to work for it. Think about it. What did the thief do on the cross? Was he baptized? Did he work for it? He just believed. And Christ said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. As we look at this Passover story and we look at what Jesus is going through and, and, and the Jews, if we look at the priests, the higher-ups, the, uh, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the upper crust of the Judaism and the religion there, they wanted Jesus gone. I did a Bible study one time in here when I was coming from Brother Rick, and we talked about the challenge in Reposte where they would challenge Jesus oftentimes in these markets to a debate, and they would try to trip Jesus up, but every time it ended up falling back on them, and they ended up looking like fools because who can contend with God? Who can argue with God and win? But we think of Jesus, we think of what he was going through. The Jews wanted him dead. The Pharisees, the priests wanted him dead. Pontius Pilate, he just wanted to keep peace. He didn't want any rebellion because he didn't want to have to answer to Caesar. He wanted everything to run smooth. But it was a custom among them that before the Passover, they would allow one prisoner to be freed. So Pontius Pilate was going to give him a choice. Jesus... Or the man I want to talk about tonight, Barabbas. What we know of Barabbas, he was a rebel. Part of his character, he was a rebel. He tried to overthrow the Roman government. He was a seditionist. And he was a murderer. And in some places they say he was a bandit. Not a man of high character. But they had a choice, release unto him Barabbas or Jesus. Pilate found no fault in Jesus, and he tried three times to get them to take Jesus and leave Barabbas, but they wanted it. They wanted Barabbas. And they cried, free Barabbas. And if anything happens, Christ's blood be on us. So Barabbas. In Luke 23, 18, it says, And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city, and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them, but they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. In verse 22, And he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? What had Jesus done? He had healed the lepers. He had made the blind to see. He had made the lame to walk. He said, I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. And they released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. So there was Barabbas. Woke up in prison. 
probably thinking, you know, they're going to hang me on that cross. I'm going to be crucified just like the thieves and just like the other murderers. That's where I'm going. But Barabbas, and before we judge too harshly on him and his character flaws, which he had, let's don't judge him too harshly. Because a lot of the same things we're guilty of. Barabbas was a murderer and was given freedom at the expense of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of us in here have been given freedom at the expense of the Lord Jesus Christ. So before we point at Barabbas, let's remember what God did for us in our sinful nature. See, the cross... I believe, was made for Barabbas. If they hadn't let him go, I believe he would have been crucified with all the other thieves and the murderers and the rebels. You see, the cross was made for Barabbas, but the Lord Jesus Christ was born for the cross. From the manger to the cross, it was his destiny. And the devil tried to stop it a lot of times, and he failed every time. There's nothing that was going to keep Jesus from the cross. The crowd wanted Barabbas set free, and the blood of Jesus spilled. Many say that Barabbas got away free. He escaped his punishment, and it's true. But it's also true of me and you. Because at the Lord's expense, in our belief, we escape our punishment. Just like Barabbas. Barabbas was a justly condemned sinner, just like you and me. Is there anyone in here that's not a sinner? Barabbas was a justly condemned sinner, just like you and me. Jesus was an innocent sufferer. An innocent sufferer had taken Barabbas' place. And who else's place did Jesus take? Ours. So before we look down on a sinner like Barabbas, let's remember what Christ did for us. An innocent sufferer had taken Barabbas' place. An innocent sufferer took mine and your place. Barabbas had done nothing to merit the substitution. Have any of us done anything to merit the substitution? Anybody in here done anything to merit what Christ has done for you? Barabbas had done nothing to merit the substitution of Christ on the cross. We likewise have done nothing to merit that. It's all grace. It's grace. And if you're out there in Facebook world and you're listening to me and you think, well, you don't know what I've done or I've done a lot of sins. Well, look, Barabbas was a murderer, a rebel. Look at what all of us has done. We're all sinners. Yet Christ took our place on the cross. Christ's substitution on the cross satisfied the law. So all those things that apply to Barabbas apply to us. He was freed by Jesus. He was let out of prison. And in Isaiah 53, 5, it says, But he... Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. That can kind of sum up Passover. We've been released from, for those of us that believe, we've been released from a prison of sin. I used to live in a prison of sin. I spent 31, 32 years of my life Lost. I did. I chased everything in the world. I've chased everything in the world, but then I went to a revival. And I'd been hearing the 
word preached and preached and preached. And that night I raised my hand and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he took a sinner like me and saved me. And years later, look where I stand now. So I'm a living testament that God and Christ can use the baser things of the world because he used me. The simple things, he used me. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God, but yet he went to the cross for us. He went to the cross for us nevertheless. Not out of obligation, but out of love. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the, gift of God, <clears throat> but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. As I look at this and I think about Barabbas, you know, Barabbas was the first man to have a practical experience of the atonement. He was freed for something that he didn't deserve. He was freed for something he didn't do. And he was spared his death probably on a cross by the substitutional sacrifice of an innocent sufferer. That's the atonement. So he could very well be, as far as what we're told in scriptures, the very first person to practically experience the atonement. I hope that not only this week, but all year, we all think about what Christ did for each and every one of us. The love he showed, the mercy he gave, to each and every one of us. And compared to what he did for us, he asked so little back. We owe him a great debt. We owe him our eternal life. We owe him freedom from hell. We don't have to go there. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us. He took on our sin. He was sinless. I don't even believe he ever thought of sin. But he took our sins upon him. And I think, you know, when they get done with the, the, the scourging and all, if you ever looked in what all takes place there, it's horrible. It's a terrible thing, and you read in Psalms 22, and you read about the crucifixion, that they plucked his beard out of his face, that they whipped him with a cat of nine tails till they, you could see his bones. They put a crown of thorns. It says he didn't even have the visage anymore of a man. I think that the way he looked on the outside, not even recognizable as a man, when we live in sin and we stay in sin and we don't get saved, I think that's what the sinner looks like on the inside. Sin, left to its own course, is going to carry you farther than you're willing to go. It's going to keep you there longer than you're willing to stay. And if you're listening to me on Facebook and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the same innocent sufferer that went to the cross for me and for Barabbas went for you. In Galatians 3.13, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's what I'm saying is when Christ looks at the Savior, when he looks at us that have been saved, he sees his son. When he looks at the lost sinner, he sees the curse of the law. And they will be judged by the law. And if we're judged by the law, we all are found wanting. There's no hope for any of us if we're going to be judged by the law.
Barabbas did nothing to deserve it, neither did us. And as I looked in the mirror one morning, and I was thinking, when I look in the mirror, if I'm honest, I can see Barabbas because I was a sinner just like him. And we say, well, I've never killed anyone. I've never done the things that Barabbas has done. You see, it's a slippery slope when you start comparing your sins. I've never murdered anyone, according to the Ten Commandments. Word murder or kill there is criminal fanyan. It means to lie in wait and to kill someone. And people want to say, you know, I look at all these people and they talk about Jesus and they've got him like a hippie and he's just cool. And, you know, now they've got this thing coming out that I find interesting. Uh, it's been all over uh, the lead up to the Super Bowl. It's about Jesus and washing the feet. Who, what is that? Anybody? The name escapes me. He gets us. Okay, well, you know, when you go to try to dig down and find out who's behind that, you can't. <laughs> but he gets us. And they've got all these images, and what they imply is that Jesus forgives everything, doesn't require judgment. He just takes you as you are. Now, that's not what the Bible says. But that's what they do. He gets us. He gets us in our sin. He gets us where we're at. That's a lie from the pit of hell. He gets us. But I want to say that I have discovered, you know, Jesus Christ, it said he didn't come to do away with the law. He said he came to fulfill it. Jesus is not some feel-good hippie figure. He's the Son of God. He's God incarnate in the flesh. And now, you know, Brother Rick's talked about it, and I've, I've been in arguments with him, the Calvinists, but now there's another thing coming up. Now there's a big argument over the Trinity. <laughs> arguing over things that shouldn't even be an argument. But when we look at Jesus... And I see the reflection of Barabbas in myself, a sinner deserving hell, having done nothing to deserve what Jesus done for me, but I'm so thankful that he loved me enough to take my place on the cross and set me free. And we look and we try to compare our sins to Barabbas and we say, well, I haven't done what he's done. Speaking of murder, speaking of adultery, Jesus Christ said this. In Matthew 5, 27, he said, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. I've never committed adultery. My wife, for 29 years. But Jesus says, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery. Jesus takes it a step farther. He says, you even think it, you're guilty of it. In 1 John 3, 15, it says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Jesus took it a step further. He didn't make it any laxer. He got right on down there where the rubber meets the road. Anyone that hates their brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer have eternal life abiding in him. So guess what? If any of us are guilty of hating our brother in the past or hating our sister or hating someone, guess what we are? According to what Jesus said, we're a murderer. What was Barabbas? A murderer. So before we go throwing Barabbas under the bus, let's look in the mirror at us. And I say these things not to put anyone down. I say these things that you may glory in the cross. Amen. You may glory in what Christ has done for you. That's why I say it. 
that the innocent sufferer would go to the cross. According to Jesus, for adulterers and murderers like us. James 2.10, it says, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said, do not kill, said also, do not kill. If thou, <clears throat> if thou now commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So just because I broke this one and I didn't break all, the rest of them, God said if you break one, you broke them all. In Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. You got some beliefs out there that believe that you don't sin. I don't know what standard they're going by. I'm a sinner. I ain't proud of it. But you know how I know that I'm a sinner? This book. This book lets you know. If your life ain't aligning with this book, your life ain't right. Let me say this. As failed creatures, if we're not attempting or trying to attempt to align our lives with this book, because I fail at it a lot, but making every effort to stay in the book. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? No wonder Jesus Christ had to go to the cross. With a heart that's desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, we can't rectify the situation ourselves. We're all sinners and reserved to damnation, but Christ intervened, God himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and made the way of redemption upon the cross. He opened the door of our prison of sin. If we accept the cross and his sacrifice for our sins, we're forgiven. We've done nothing to merit it, merit it just like Barabbas did nothing. Christ paid it all for us. Think about it. Christ paid it all. For every th evil thought we have, Christ paid for it. For every evil thought we've ever had, Christ accepted the guilt. For every lie ever told, Christ accepted the guilt. For every lustful thought or act we've ever committed, Christ accepted the guilt. For every hateful thought or deed we've done, Christ accepted the guilt. For every covetous thought or act we've committed, Christ accepted the guilt. For every murderer, Christ has accepted the guilt. For every thief, Christ has accepted the guilt. Power in the cross. A holy God had to come down and meet a depraved man. A depraved man couldn't go up there. Can't nothing enter up there that's not holy. So God came down to depraved man at the intersection where they met at the cross. And a way was made. For us, for the Barabbases of the world, of which we all are. Jesus paid it all. There's only one sin he did not atone for, and that's the sin of unbelief. In Hebrews 11:6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is God, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. John 3, 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son have everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Got to believe. I'm only going to close one time tonight. I've always been told that the closing is the best part. That's why I usually do it two or three times. But I'm going to try to stick to one. 
Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. John 14, 6, Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All these other religions out there trying to get in some other way. Lord help us. That's right, Brother Mike. Lord help us. The craziness that's going on out there. All kind of churches popping up with all kind of nonsense. Churches that, sadder than that, is churches that used to hold the biblical doctrine are now splitting over things that aren't even, shouldn't even be issues. How can a church be a church and be contrary to the book? I mean, if God didn't write this, and if every bit of it not true, then everything's in vain. I have yet to find one thing in here, and I've read it from cover to cover. I have yet to find one thing in here not be true. There's some things I don't understand in my mind, and I'll go to my grave not understanding everything. But if one thing in here can be proved false, then it's all false. And things that are clearly stated in this book, and I'm not going to get in them, but things that are clearly stated that are sin and called sin by God, man wants to rewrite it and say they're not. We don't have the authority for that. Matter of fact, let me tell you something. I'm not a, I'm not a skittish person in a lot of things, but I tell you what, I'm scared to death to preach anything contrary to that book. Now, that scares me. And I've said before, standing right here, that if I intentionally do anything to mislead anyone in this book, if I intentionally do anything, may God strike me dead right here in front of everybody so that I will be an example of what not to do. Now, can I make a mistake? Sure. My wife will confirm that. But, but the Lord Jesus is the door through which there is salvation. Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John 10.1, Verily, verily, I say unto you that he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. And there's a lot of thievery and robbery going on from the pulpit. So, Back to Barabbas for a moment. We're not told what happened to Barabbas. It's kind of left to the imagination. All we know is that he was freed. And a man in his condition, if I'm there and I'm on death row and I'm knowing I'm probably going to be crucified, I would be, you know, what would happen if you're let out? Just boom. You can go. We're not told. We're not told what happened to him. Perhaps one of the things he could have done is his newfound freedom, he could have said, who is this man? Who is this man that's taking my place? I got to go. So maybe he went to the cross. And maybe he watched the man be crucified that took his place. Maybe it worked in his heart. Maybe the murderer and the thief became a follower. I don't know. Then again, after what he saw and what he experienced, could he just been indifferent to all of it? Could he just been indifferent to it and went on about his way, giving it another thought? Could be. There's too many people out there. If you're within the sound of my voice tonight, you've heard the gospel. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, and you've heard what I've said tonight, are you indifferent to it? But really, the question is not what became of Barabbas. The question is, what will become of you and me?
and Facebook people the question is what will become of you? That's the question. And I think this is an applicable verse that I close with. Matthew 13, 1 through 6. It says, The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. Has your heart become so stony that the gospel doesn't grow in it? Has your heart become so stony as these seeds that failed here when difficult times come, you, you spring up, but when difficult times come, your faith and your belief just withers away because you had no root in it. Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality, and it's a lifestyle. It's not just something we do three days a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. It's a lifestyle. He says, some fell by the wayside, the fowls ate them. Some fell on the stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up. They had no deepest of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. The thorns that sprang up and choked them out. You ever planted a garden? How long does it take for the weeds to start coming up? And if you ain't out there tending it, what happens? You don't tend it. You go out there and you, you, you garden, your tomatoes and everything else done grown up, thistles and thorns. Same with our faith. It's the same with our walk. If we don't read, if we don't... You know one of the greatest things I figured out that helps me a lot is praying for other people. Try it. Just pray for other people. And you know, if everybody's praying for somebody else, you know what happens? It kind of makes a circle if somebody's praying for you. But they fell upon the thorns and the thistles. I liken that to the thorns and the thistles are the things of this life that we allow to choke out the important things, the distractions of life, the thorns. But some fell on good ground and brought forth fruit some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear? Let him hear. I don't know what became of Barabbas. I would like to think he went to the cross and he had a transformation for what was done for him. I would like to think that every one of us in here, we allow the gospel to take root. And because what we've seen done on the cross and what we know transpired, it makes us want to serve him more. It makes us want to be a little kinder and a little gentler. It makes us want to read the Bible. It makes us want to pray for people. It makes us want to serve. And then if you're out there and you're just indifferent to it all, then God help you because there's a judgment coming. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, to come out, come here, Lord, to be able to open up your word, Father, and just to, just to partake of it, Lord, feast upon it, Lord. And I pray for each and every one of us here tonight, Lord. I pray that we will touch by your word, Father, to the point we'll go out, Father, and we'll live your word every day, Lord, wherever we're at, in the workplace, in the hallways, at the schools, Lord, wherever we go, in the lines at Walmart, everywhere we go, we'll be a witness for you, Lord, and we'll go out and live a life that you would have us to live, Lord, to bear fruit for your kingdom. And, Lord, every little piece that we have is your people. Every little piece where you've planted us, Lord, may we work and be fruitful there that the, the, your kingdom would increase, the devil's kingdom decrease. May we all have a part in it. Lord, I pray as we go through the rest of this week, we'll contemplate the things that you were going through all the way up to the cross. An innocent sufferer, an innocent sufferer for sinners such as us. I'm thankful for it, Lord. I'm thankful for the cross. I'm thankful for the blood. I'm not ashamed of it, Lord. I proclaim it. I pray others will, will just not be indifferent to it. I pray others will just take strength and power in it, Lord. I pray that you'll be with us the rest of this week. Bring us back. Bring us back this Passover, Lord. And just I pray for your blessings upon us. Forgive us where we fail you. These things I ask in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.
Amen.